<clears throat> on a place called Blackwell's Island, which is now actually called Welfare Island in New York, there's a graveyard for criminals. And on one of the grave markers it reads, Here's, here lie the fragments of John Smith who contradicted his maker and played football with the Ten Commandments. He departed this life at age 35. His mother and wife weep for him. No one else does. May he rest in peace. Can't divide, you can't defy God by playing football with the Ten Commandments. Now, in this day and age in which we live, we know that we can't have eternal life by keeping the Ten Commandments, by keeping the law. Most people know that. Some people don't know that. As Christians, we have a tendency to say, well, I'm covered by the blood of Christ, and so therefore I don't have to be really strict on trying to follow all the Ten Commandments because I'm already forgiven and I have the, I'm covered in the righteousness of Christ. Well, the Ten Commandments were given by God so that we realize that we could not keep them, but that's no excuse that we shouldn't allow the life of Jesus Christ, who never sinned, to live through us, and as, as He lives through us, we should sin less and less because he never broke any of God's commandments. Now, as we look at the Ten Commandments today in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, death had passed from Adam and Eve to every person who ever lived, and the law had not been given until Moses came along. God gave one command to Adam and Eve. He says, you can eat of anything, any tree in the garden, but you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of that tree, you will die. And so Satan came up and he says, God's lying to you. If you eat from that tree, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. You'll know the difference between good and evil. She thought, well, the fruit looks really good. So she took a bite of it and says, hey, this is all right. Now, Adam knew better. But she offered it to Adam and he took it. Why? But he didn't want to lose Eve? I don't know. And so from that point on, they died spiritually and they later died physically. And every person who ever lived at that time, except for Enoch, and God took him home, people died. And the law had not been given. But when Moses came along and God gave Moses the law, that really sealed it. Because God says, with the law, this is my moral code. And this is the way God is. If you want to see what God's like, look at the Ten Commandments. If you want to see what Jesus like, is like, look at the Ten Commandments. God does not sin, and Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, so Jesus Christ never sins. And God says, you be holy, for I am holy. Now, we don't take that literally. We think, oh, I, don't, I can't be as holy as Jesus Christ. God says, yeah, that's why you're in trouble. And so God gave the Ten Commandments, which is kind of a summary of what God wants uh, in holiness from our lives. God gave the Ten Commandments not so that we could go to heaven. He gave the Ten Commandments to show us that we can't keep them. Amen. Now, several years ago, I was speaking to about a hundred and something teenagers. And the people said, uh, Brother Jim, you can preach whatever you want to preach. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do something they've probably never heard. I'm going to preach on the Ten Commandments. So it was a youth camp. So I preached on the Ten Commandments. And then I ran to Jesus Christ and shared the gospel. So after the evening chapel service, they went back to their cabins, to their 
uh, their leaders of each cabin, and they had their evening devotions. And so that night, the different leaders decided we're going to ask the kids what they thought of Brother Jim's message, the teenagers. And they all said, he was too hard on us. They said, Brother Jim was too hard on us. Why did they feel that way? Because they were so overwhelmed with what the Ten Commandments tell us that we have to live like, they messed up every one of them. They said, Brother Jim was too hard on us. So we go to uh, Exodus chapter 20, and God says, He spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, Egypt was a place where they worshipped every kind of God you could think of. And so those people had lived for 400 years in Egypt, and all they saw were Egyptians worshiping all these weird gods. And God came along and talked to Pharaoh, says, you let my people go. And Pharaoh said, I'm not going to do it. And God brought plague after plague after plague after plague after plague. And each plague was designed to make a fool of one of the gods or more of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped. It's like the Egyptians worshipped frogs. God says, oh, you like frogs? And so the whole land was covered with frogs. So God made all those different Egyptian gods, and they worshipped more than just ten, including Pharaoh himself. But he made those gods, those primary gods, to look stupid because they were unable to compete with the true and living God. Now, they're leaving Egypt. And it says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, God begins to give these Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You don't worship any other gods. I'm the true and living God. Now, Today, we worship all kinds of things. We, we worship money, the love of money. We worship sex. Uh, we worship drugs. Uh, we worship uh, power and prestige. Uh, we want to be uh, noticed, and we worship our, we worship our own uh, value in front of other people. We worship other people. We worship possessions. We worship pleasure. We worship all kinds of different things. So my question is, what is it that has a hold on you? What has a hold on your life? You, if I, when I say what has a hold, a grip on your life, you already know what it is. You already know what it is. Now, if, let's say if you, if you were a lover of money, and you wanted to get, become a millionaire by the time you were 30 years old, and so I announced on Sunday night, we're, give, we're going to give away $1,000 to every person who comes to church on Sunday night. Well, all the lovers of money would be here. But when we offer the Word of God on Sunday night, those people who say they're Christians and love the Lord, they don't, a lot of those people don't come. And you beg them to come, they're still not going to come. Why? Because there's not a hunger for Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We've got some TV program, some football game, I want to take a nap, whatever it is. That's our God. We're going to worship that. It comes ahead of Jesus Christ. And when something happens in this country and we come under persecution, and you can't come and worship God anymore, you're going to try to find some way to come secretly to worship God. A lot of people don't want to come because it's Sunday morning and that's good enough for us. We did our thing for God and the rest of the week is ours. Now, if you feel that way, you need to take a second look at your relationship to Jesus Christ because something else has a grip on you besides Jesus Christ. I remember the young man that was in my, te in my youth group, teenager. <clears throat> I led him to Christ. And over a series of weeks, he came up to me one night at youth group and he says, Brother Jim, I finally understand what the real Christian life is all about. I said, what's that? And his name was Jim too. I said, what's that, Jim? He says, if I'm a Christian, he said, I want to be obsessed with Jesus Christ. I want to be obsessed with Jesus Christ. Are you obsessed with Jesus Christ? Well, no, that's, I'm just the average Christian. Well, I hate to tell you this, but the Ten Commandments are summed up in two great commandments. God takes the Ten Commandments and He sums them up. What's the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Why are you not hungry for Jesus Christ? Why even come to church on Sunday? 
if you're not going to love him with all your heart and soul and strength. Because it makes us feel good. Because we're respectable. We're Christians. The community looks at us as really nice people. And you may be a nice person, but a lot of nice people go to hell. And so he says, <clears throat> the very first commandment, the very first one, you shall have no other gods before me. That means your flat screen TV should not come ahead of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy life because God has given us all good gifts to enjoy, but they should not come ahead of Him. <clears throat> you say, oh, Brother Jim's being too hard on us. Just like those teenagers, Brother Jim's too hard on us. No, I'm not hard on you. I'm telling you what he says. I'm just carrying the message. Don't shoot the messenger. Number two, uh, you shall not make up for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is under, beneath the earth, that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. So it doesn't mean you can't have a picture of a fish on the wall. Just don't worship it. For I am the Lord your God is a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So if you're a person who hates the Lord... Your children are probably going to hate him too, and your grandchildren are going to hate him too, and your great-grandchildren are going to hate him too, unless God's able to step in and intervene, because to, to hate the Lord or to worship some pagan God, it's contagious. God says, when you go into the promised land, I want you to wipe out all those pagan nations because they were offering their children alive to Molech, and they were offering them alive into the fire, burning their children. God said it's so corrupt. And, 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 and different archaeologists said they found some evidence where children, some children were volunteering to die from Molech. And God says the only way I can stop that is just eradicate all that pagan idolatry. And he says when you go in, clean it out. And Israel didn't do it. They cleaned out some of it. But what happened over and over again... They began to worship Molech. They began to worship Baal. The, the Jews, the children of Israel came into the promised land and they always kept going back to idolatry. And they always had their pagan gods and they always had their, their wooden statues up on top of the mountain and they worshiped all these pagan gods. And God says, you'll take a, take a piece of wood, you'll cut it in half, you'll carve a god out of that piece of wood, you'll worship that piece of wood, then you'll take the other piece of wood and put it in fire to warm yourself. How stupid are we? And so the first one, the first one, you shall have no other gods before me. Secondly, don't carve anything and worship it. Or don't manufacture it and worship it. Or don't buy it and worship it. And so he says, but I'll show mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. The only problem is no, nobody can keep all the commandments. You can't keep them. Number three, you shall, take, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does that mean? It means when you say God, oh my God, or GD, or you even talk about God when you don't mean it, or you're singing hymns on Sunday, people say, no, nah, that's not true. When you're singing hymns on Sunday and you're using God's name, you're not even thinking about what you're saying. You sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. We ought to know it from memory. And we don't think about it. We're not really concentrating on what we're saying. It's a habit. It's just like when you go out to eat. We bow and thank the Lord for our food because it is a habit. We're not really thankful. We're not really thinking about it. We do things and you start a meeting you start the meeting with prayer. Why? Because that's what usually what people do. It's a habit. But we don't really think about what we're praying. It's, it's sad when we pray and we're praying things that come to our mind, but we don't really mean it. We're not really talking to the Lord. We're just praying a prayer that sounds good to people who are listening to it. And so God says, <clears throat> You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now I know how I feel when I... I was visiting with someone recently, Saturday, and they kept saying, oh my God, oh my God. I hate that. Don't say that. Just say, oh, 
What Charlie Brown, good grief. <laughs> but don't say, oh my God. And don't say GD. You're allowed to get punched in the face if you say that. All right, now, God is protective of his name. I'm protective of my name. When I was born, my grandfather begged my family, don't name him Jim Vale. Daddy says, why? He says, I know a Jim, my grandfather says, I know a Jim Vale. He's the sorriest man that walked this earth. Well, they wanted to name me Jim anyway, so they named me James, James Richard. I'm protective of my name. If I get on Facebook and I see somebody named Jim Vale, and he's just, you can tell he's a druggie, uh, he's a womanizer by the things he says and the pictures he puts up there or something, and it makes me angry. It's like, don't call yourself Jim Vale, because that's me. Alexander the Great, the story goes, says, at one time there was a young man that was caught trying to steal a horse. And they brought him to Alexander the Great. And the young boy was scared to death. And Alexander the Great says, young man, what's your name? He said, Alexander, sir. What's your name? Alexander, sir. So he pushed him down on the ground and he pointed at him. He says, you either change your ways or change your name. And so God is jealous of his name. Don't talk about God unless you mean it. Don't say, oh my God, you got to get out of that habit. We had some, someone speak at our church years ago. And they were in the habit of saying, oh my God. I had to pull them aside and you said, I said, you, you can't say, oh my God, you're taking God's name in vain. I love you. Please don't do it anymore. Okay, so then we go to the next one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, some people are going to go back to the law and say, well, you have to do it on Saturday. Well, the New Testament church, uh, if you look on, uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the New Te in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, uh, 16, 2, the New Testament church worshiped the Lord on the first day of the week instead of the last day of the week because Jesus Christ arose from the dead on the first day of the week. So they changed it from Saturday to the first day of the week in remembrance of the fact that we have a risen Savior. But the God's point is, you take one day a week and you keep that holy where you rest and you concentrate on Him and honor Him and worship Him. Now, my daddy was not a Christian. My daddy was a good man, but he was not a Christian. We were not a Christian home. We didn't have any Bibles in our home. We didn't pray except before Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner, the only time we ever prayed. But my daddy would say, don't go, out there and play, don't go out there and play ball on Sunday. That's the Lord's day. Don't go fishing on Sunday. That's the Lord's day. My dad had respect for that, and he wasn't even a Christian. And so <clears throat> the day that you have a day to be rest, resting and worshiping the Lord, you need to take every advantage of that to honor Him and to love Him and to worship Him. So he says... Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You say, we don't have to do that now. We're not under the law. You're not under the law, not for salvation you're not. But if you walk with the Lord, you're going to want to follow His moral code, not for salvation, but because He says, you be holy as I am holy. And that's really holy. Okay, so the first, the first, four, the first four commandments, they deal with our relationship to God. Then you have the next commandments, and they deal with our relationship to other people. And so some of these commandments correspond with people correspond with the commandments in our relationship to God. So the first one, while Jesus Christ honored and glorified His Father in all that He did, He didn't do anything without contacting His Father. He honored His Father. And so when you come to how to deal with people, in commandment number five, it says, Honor thy father and mother. And so I'm going to read that. 
Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land. Now, what's the other side of the coin? If you dishonor your father and mother, you're going to die earlier than you would have if you'd honored your parents. You mean I'm going to die when I'm 20 years old? It might, but you might live to be 60 years old. But if you'd honored your parents, you might have lived to be 90 years old. You're going to die quicker if, if you don't honor your parents than if you had honored your parents. And that's a reflection of Jesus Christ honoring his Father. Now, some people say, oh, I just hate it. I hate drugs. I'm going to do all I can to stop the drug trade. I, I, human trafficking. I'm going to do all I can to stop human trafficking. I'm going to try to stop uh, drunk drivers. I'm going to do all I can to stop abortion, whatever it is. Those things are really important. But God says, above all, you are to honor thy father and mother. And if you don't honor your father and mother, then all the rest of these good things that you're standing for, you're a hypocrite. You're being hypocritical. You're saying, I love God. I'm going to stop drunk driving or whatever it is. But you dishonor your parents. So God says, in the, in the book of Ephesians, it says, this is the first commandment that God gave that has a promise attached to it. God, it's the first commandment with a promise. Why? Because it's so important to God. It's a picture of Jesus Christ honoring His Father. We take that lightly. Ah, my mom and dad are all stupid. I don't care. My, my dad's a drunk. Uh, my mama, she's, she's a terrible mother. And, and so we just badmouth our parents. God says, I don't care what your parents are like. You don't have to like them, but you are to honor and respect your parents. Now, as a child, you're to obey your parents until your parents give you their blessing for you to be out on your own, and then they become like an advisory committee. But as long as you live, you are to honor your parents. If you're married and have 50 kids, you're still to honor your parents. And if you dishonor your parents, you're going to answer to God one day for that, and you may even have your life come to an end more quickly if you, than you, if, if you had honored them. So he says, honor thy father and mother, and what, here's the promise, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. What happened to Absalom, King David's son? Absalom was so good looking, he could have been a movie star. They say he was the best looking guy in the whole country. And he decided that he could do a better job being king than his daddy could. So he would go to the gate, and when people had problems, he would say, here, my, my dad's busy, come here, I'll take care of that for you. And so he began to handle their problems, and he began to win the people over to where he finally decided, we're going to get rid of my dad, and I'm going to become king. And he was even willing to have his, his father murdered. Well, how did God handle that? Well, Absalom, he was kind of like this stud muffin. He had real long hair. And so he was riding on his mule, and he was, he was you know, trying to get away from people who were loyal to King David, and his hair got hung in a tree branch. And the mule kept going. And it's like God saying, hey, 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 why don't you kind of hang around here for a little bit? Well, he's hanging by his hair. He looked like Howdy Doody. Well, you don't know who Howdy Doody is, except us older folks. He was a puppet on TV. He was just hanging there. And so King David had already said, now, you know, don't harm my son Absalom. Well, they knew he was a threat to the king. So finally they just said, all right, just run him through. So the general took his spear and ran him through the heart several times and killed him. Absalom died a young man. He dishonored his father. Now, his father didn't want his son to die, but God says, hey, you violated it, you're dead. <clears throat> honor your father and mother. Do you honor your parents? Father's Day's coming up next Sunday. You're going to honor your father, or are you just going to just, hey, Dad, how you doing? Happy Father's Day. I'll see you later. Bye. If he even gets that. Honor your father and mother. How would you honor your parents? Show gratitude, thankfulness, love them, whatever it is. You show honor to your parents. Now, and, and you go to Asian countries over in the, you know, the Orient, that culture honors elderly people. They're held in high esteem. Today, our country looks at older people as stupid people. If you're an older person, you're stupid. If you're a pastor, you're stupid. 
And so if you're moral and you're a virgin, you're not out having sexual immorality as a young person, you're stupid. People hate things that are honoring to the Lord. So if you're going to honor the Lord, people are going to look at you as you're stupid. The next one, you shall not murder. Now you have to go to war, that's one thing. But if somebody makes you mad and you kill them, God says, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, I can't do that. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you, are, if you hate, your, if you're angry at your brother, you're guilty of murdering him in your heart. You say, I've never killed anybody. Yeah, but have you ever thought about it? People in their hearts secretly wish they could kill somebody or see somebody die. But I've never murdered anybody. Well, I hate to tell you, in my heart I have. I've had a lot of secret thoughts. But if you're in war, and the United States is at war with Germany, would you be, be uh, sinning against God if you shot Adolf Hitler and killed him? No, he was an enemy of the country. You're defending freedom. If somebody breaks into your house and they're trying to kill my wife, oh, Jim, thou shalt not kill. Hey, the guy's dead meat. I mean, I'm ready. Somebody comes into my house and I don't know who they are and they haven't said anything, I'll shoot them first and ask questions later. But if I have somebody that I just don't like and I want to see them dead, God says you killed them in your heart. You should not do it. Now, if you're living an immoral life, you're having sex and you're not married to that person, and you get pregnant, and you think, I don't know what I'm going to do. My mom and daddy are going to kill me. Or I still got to finish college, and I, I, I can't take off time to have a baby. I, I, I'm going to get my college career done, so I'm going to go get an abortion. I hate to tell you, but you're murdering that baby. That is murder. God will hold you responsible for that. And people say, I don't know why they haven't found a cure for cancer. I'll tell you why. We've probably killed the person. We probably aborted the person who would have found a cure. We've murdered almost 70 million people. We say Adolf Hitler during, <coughs> excuse me, Adolf Hitler during World War II, he was a monster. He killed between 6 to 10 million Jews. Hey, he's a Sunday school teacher compared to America. We've murdered almost 70 million little innocent babies who've never done anything wrong. And people who have their babies murdered, they don't realize that little baby, that little baby would have loved her unconditionally more than anybody else on the face of the earth, and she, she murdered it. That little baby would have trusted its mama, and she murdered it. You say, I had an abortion, nobody knows it, you're making me feel guilty. It's because you are guilty. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move on. You shall not steal. You shall not steal. Will a man rob God? God says you've, in Malachi, he says you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. So God says he wants a minimum of 10%. Anything else above that is gravy. But God says when you don't tithe to God and give him back what is due him, you're robbing him. You say, you're just saying that because you're a pastor and you want more money to come into the church. No, I'm not. God's going to provide for my needs whether the church does or not. But we're to give unto the Lord. And God says, give, and it will be given back to you, good measure, pressed together, shaken down, running over. They will pour into your lap, for by your standard of measure, it will be given back to you in return. But we rob God. And we're not to rob other people. If you've got a drug problem, nobody knows about it, it's sin to go and steal mo money out of your mother's purse. Or to cheat on your income tax. Thou shalt not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know what that means? Don't go around telling lies. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says, all liars will find their, their, their part in the fire that burns with uh, fire and brimstone. 
Washington, D.C. is full of them. It's like a fire ant mound. There are more liars in Washington, D.C. and in the press than I've ever seen in my life. You can't trust anything you hear on TV or radio. You can't trust anything you hear from the CDC. You can't trust anything coming out of Congress or out of the White House or out of the Supreme Court. Oh, you can. There are a few people, but I'm generally speaking. I don't, tr I don't trust anybody anymore. Not unless I know they love the Lord. Because unsafe people have a secret hidden agenda. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor any of thing that is your neighbor's. We're not to covet anything that belongs to someone else. King David coveted Bathsheba. I don't know how she got the name Bathsheba. That's what got her in trouble. I had to name her something like Dry Clean Sheba. I don't know. He saw a lady, she was dry cleaning herself. Sprinkling baby powder on her head. No, Bathsheba, he saw her and he, he uh, coveted another man's wife. He took her, got her pregnant. When he found out she was pregnant, then he had her husband murdered and hoped that he got away with it. And for a long time, he refused to confess it to the Lord until Nathan the prophet says, hey, you're the man. And you stole a man's wife and you had the, the man murdered. And God said, the sword will never leave your home, David. Not covet. Don't be coveting what other people have. If you have a need, God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. So whatever's in your life that you need, you're seeking first Jesus Christ and intimacy with Him, He will meet your needs. And sometimes you have no idea how He's going to do it. When you come to the next part, the people are not, they're given the Ten Commandments, but before they're given the Ten Commandments, it says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, the flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will hear, but don't let God speak to us lest we die. They were terrified. In other words, God's saying, hey, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments, but I want to get your attention. Can you imagine how terrifying it would be to, to break all of God's commandments and die without Christ and stand before Him? You think this was terrifying? You'd be horrified to stand before God and He'll say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And so they said, You speak with us and we will hear, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. God said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you and that, he may, uh, that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. It's good to fear God. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God, God was. And today we live in a society where people have no fear of God. No respect of God. You, some of you have seen that picture I put on Facebook where a guy said, when Jesus comes back, kill him again. Another girl says, hey, I had an abortion and I'm proud of it. No fear of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. In other words, I'm going to talk to you about my altar. <clears throat> You're not to put any statue of any other God in there at my altar. I don't want anything else in there with me but me. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make them for yourselves. You're not to put statues of all these saints all around and pray to them. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice only burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. And if you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. Why? Because when you worship me, your own human effort, I don't want it. You come to me by faith, not by your works. For you have, he says, if you use a tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up to, uh, by steps to my altar that your nakedness may not be exposed. 
So it's like, hey, I don't want anything to distract people. So if you're going up the steps of the altar and everybody can see up your pants or your robe, uh-uh. So don't go up by steps. Have it low enough to where you can get to it without climbing up steps and the wind blowing up your, your robe or whatever it is. Now, I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about... <clears throat> when people were offering sacrifices under the law. Now, when, when God gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, He gave the Ten Commandments, and then He went to talking about the altar. Why? Because they couldn't keep the, they couldn't keep the commandments, so they had to offer sacrifices and blood offerings to God in order to cut, uh, turn back God's wrath for them breaking His laws. So it spoke of sacrifice. And so, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not, God, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, Jesus Christ is talking, which are offered according to the law. So before Jesus came, they still had to offer sacrifices which pointed to the Savior who was coming. People were saved by looking by faith to the Savior who is coming, we're saved by, by trusting in the Savior who's already come. Then he says, Behold, I have come to do your will, Jesus Christ is saying, O God. He takes away the first, the offerings under the law, that he may establish the second, Jesus Christ offering himself on the, sacri on the cross as a sacrifice. By this, by that will we have been sanctified, that means set apart as God's own child. You have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. They offered sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice in the Old Testament and it still, it still was not sufficient. But they were looking to the sacrifice who was coming. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said that twice in the same chapter, and those Jews knew what he was talking about. He was God's Lamb. He was God's sacrifice. And it says when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died one time, and He, he did it for all of us. Verse 11, Every priest in the Old Testament stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he won't, he won't die a second time. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down at the right hand of God. No longer to sacrifice ever again. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, one offering, he has perfected forever. One offering of Christ on the cross, when you trust him as your Savior, repenting of your sin, God makes you perfect in his sight forever. You cannot lose your salvation. You can't keep yourself saved. For by one offering has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You're becoming more and more like Christ in your walk, and you're already, see, you're already separated as God's child. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses for us after He had said this, This is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. When you come to know Christ, you want to please Him. You want to obey Him. You want to live for Him. You don't want to take advantage of your salvation. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he said, and, and what? When you sin against God, the Holy Spirit says, uh, 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 eh, don't do that, you sin. So he puts it in your heart and mind. You're dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. When you come to know Christ, everything that God has recorded in heaven to send you to hell for is wiped clean by the blood of Christ. So he says, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's nothing recorded to send you to hell for. And then now where there is remission or forgiveness of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. We don't offer animal sacrifices and Jesus will never offer himself as a sacrifice ever again. Now, I'm going to close with this. God gave the Ten Commandments. 
whether you know it or not, somehow in your heart or your actions, you have broken every one of them and I have broken every one of them. We are guilty before God. When we try to lead people to Jesus Christ and we say, oh, you need to come to Christ, you'll have an abundant life. God has a wonderful plan for your life. That's fine. But we don't say too much about sin that, hey, you're an adulterer. You're a liar. You're a thief. You're a blasphemer. You've disobeyed your parents or dishonored your parents. We don't want to tell people that. They might get mad and get turned off. They have to know what trouble they're in. They stand under the wrath and condemnation of God. And then when they get saved, he says, you're my child. You can call me Abba, which is the Aramaic term for daddy. You're adopted into God's family. Your sins and iniquities he remembers no more. Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews says he's not ashamed to call you a brother or sister. You're totally forgiven. But if you do not surrender by faith your life to Jesus Christ in repentance from your sin, you will be guilty before God of breaking every one of His Ten Commandments. And God says, you be holy, for I am holy. And I don't know many people who are holy. Except through Jesus Christ. So today, if you've never come to Christ as your Savior, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I want you to get alone with the Lord, and I want you to trust Him as your Lord and Savior. And if you do, then I want you to let me know so that I can help you further. But I want you to come to Christ. If you do not, there will be a time where you will stand before Him and you will give an account and God will allow you to see your whole life that you broke this one, this commandment, this commandment, this commandment, this commandment, this commandment. You say, yeah, Lord, but didn't I preach in your name? And didn't I cast out demons in your name? And didn't I do many wonderful works in your name? And He will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Because you got into the ministry for a reputation. You got into the ministry because you wanted to be, uh, have a position of power. You wanted a following. You wanted to be noticed. You wanted to be recognized. You, whatever it is. But... You came to Christ for the wrong reason. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank You for letting us be here today. <clears throat> I thank You that You gave us the law not to make us righteous, but to show us how unrighteous we are that we need a Savior. And Lord, I thank You that we, can, we can't earn it. We can't be good enough. Good people go to hell. Religious people go to hell. Nice people go to hell if they've never trusted Jesus Christ, because in your eyes, Lord, they still broke every one of your commandments. They have not been holy. They have not been righteous. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took our sin upon yourself. You took the punishment that we deserve. We broke all of your laws, but you took the punishment as if you broke all the laws when you never did. And Lord, you've risen from the dead victorious. I thank you that we can come to you by faith, trusting in what you have already done for us because we cannot do it ourselves. We are helpless. And I pray that every person in this room will reevaluate their lives. What is it that's their God? Lord, what, what has a grip on them? Lord, it's supposed to be you. But so often the hunger for Jesus Christ is not there because we're worshiping some false God. Father, thank you for this day. I pray that it would be fruitful. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.